and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the resurrection tonight. I want to call your attention uh, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and we begin reading in verse 46. Luke, chapter 24, and verse 46. Just want to read a few verses in your hearing, and uh, we're thankful for all of these other classes that are going. What a great time, Brother Tyler Ritchie and Brother James Johnson are teaching that Financial Peace University. We're hearing great things about that. And uh, Brother Blackman and uh, myself, also Brother Ritchie, is going to help us. But we're planning a new series of classes that will start uh, next month that will be in support of our uh, next theme about being set free. Uh, we're going to start a series of messages uh, in the month of May, uh, it could possibly even be the end of April after we get past Easter and all, but we're going to start a series of messages about being free from deadly habits, free from deadly habits. And uh, we've got some other classes that we're going to be introducing on Wednesday night that will be in support of uh, people that deal with addictions and um, things of the flesh that are deadly and our killers, really, for, for all of us. I think we understand what some of those are, but some of them are perhaps not as uh, visible and not as common. But one thing that is common is that Jesus Christ can deliver us from all of them. Amen? You believe that? I know you do. What a joy it is to study God's Word. I love studying the Word of God. It's amazing, no matter where we go, what country you're in, what language, there's always a hunger to study the Word of God. And the principles of God's Word are just so uh, enriching uh, and exciting. And uh, I had a just a great time on the phone today with, well, more than once, I was um, talking with my good friend, um, Brother Jeff Arnold, that pastored in Gainesville for a number of years and was trying to help uh, get help from him about selling that car that Amy you know we felt compelled in that sacrificial Sunday to sell the uh, Mustang and so it's you know a 64 and a half Mustang and it has to you know be sold in the right uh, way to the right person and so forth that has a you know an understanding of the value of those older cars so uh, brother Arnold loves old cars and um, he's uh, been involved in that field for many, many years. And so uh, I called him to ask him, you know, where we should go to sell this car. And we just got to talking, as we usually do, about Scripture. And boy, he got to tell me about a message that he had about the resurrection. And, and um, whenever you talk with Brother Arnold, you're usually listening. Uh, you're not usually talking. It's more of a monologue than a dialogue. And, uh, and it's usually a lot of good stuff, so I just listen and try to absorb it all. But when he took a breath, I said, and I got one for you too. And I told him about Sunday night, the revelation of the cult. And he listened to that. And he said, wait a second, David. And he had, he's like, I've got to go get a piece of paper. And he started writing down, okay. He rode the cult because it was weaker, and what he touches that's weak is made strong. He said, you know what? You're like me. You're smarter than you look. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> uh, so we preached each other on the phone for about an hour and uh, just had a great time talking about the Word of God. It's the Word of God that really unites us and brings us all together, you know? It's the common denominator. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Thank you for having a hunger for God's Word. Luke 24 and verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And ye are witnesses. Now, this is referring not just to um, the people that were present 
This is referring to everyone that would read these words in the ages to come, which includes you and I. So we want to talk tonight for just a few moments in your hearing. I won't hold you long, but we want to talk about witnesses of the resurrection. Witnesses of the resurrection. There are several groups of people that witnessed the resurrection, and we're going to talk about those, three specific groups that are in the Word of God. And then I want to end with what I believe is the fourth group. And the fourth group is a group that's not in the Word of God per se. A group that would include you and I. But first, let's establish this principle, and that is that something very powerful happens when you can actually witness something. Uh, When I was a boy and we were moving to this area, all of this, of course, out here in Palm Bay was swampland. Palm Bay really kind of ended where Palm Bay Road and Babcock is. Uh, That's as far west, really, as as you could go. Uh, you could get out to the interstate um, through Malabar Road, but you had to go further south on Babcock to do that. But there was a Scotty's. Some of you that have been around here a while, you remember what a Scotty's was. That was kind of a precursor to Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, and there was a Scotty's that was right there on that corner, and that was about as far west as you could go. Everything else was east of Babcock Street, uh, Palm Bay. Uh, had about 5,000 people in it. Uh, it had one postman in the whole city, and uh, he was in our church. And he had the Palm Bay route. He had the whole route. And uh, that was Brother Whitwright, who's um, gone on to be with the Lord as of last year. But it was, uh, it was a, a much smaller area, but it was such an exciting place, especially for a seven-year-old boy like myself. Um, Disney World was opening up. Uh, 71 is the year it opened. We moved here in August of 71, so that was, uh, that was happening. But it didn't have near as big of an impact on me as what was happening up the street there in the Space Coast. They were launching these Saturn V rockets that were going to the moon and taking people to the moon. And um, I remember as a boy the vivid impact that it had on me. Of course, you know, if you've read my book, Reentry. That was sort of a shameless plug for the book, wasn't it? Uh, uh, if you've read that book, you, 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 can, you can see you know, my love for uh, the space program and all because of my exposure to it as a, as a boy, but also in, in study and in, in being interested in aeronautics and avionics and all that for the most part of my life. I, I, I think it all started because as a boy, my family, we would go down, as most people in this area would, I mean, you know, there was... Uh, people in our church, even though the church was quite small, there were people that worked in the space program. This whole area really was developing uh, in support of the space program. Harris and uh, these other companies that were here, uh, at that time it was called Radiation. <laughs> you can see why they changed that name. But um, there were all of these semiconductor groups that were here, and they were here in support of the space program. But um, there were, there were men in our church that even worked there, and they would tell stories. I remember as a boy just being exposed to all of it. and My family would go up along the uh, edge of the Indian River. We would go north as far as we could go with the crowds and the cars and all, but uh, we would go pretty far north until we got maybe in, in the, the area in between Titusville and Coco. We'd find a place and we'd camp there. And you could literally look across the river, uh, especially in the nighttime launches, and you could see that big Saturn V a rocket sitting there on the pad, pad 39A. And uh, there would be different scrubs. You know how it is with uh, space launches and all. And, and finally, you know, I can remember I'd fall asleep and they would wake me up and I'd fall asleep. And, and of course, I was young. But they uh, would say, okay, David, this is it. We're going to really do it. This is going to go this time in 10, 9, 8. And it would go down. And um, finally, whenever it launched and they ignited that those rockets, that Saturn V, it's hard to describe. It's so much bigger than, uh, you know, the shuttle and things, you know, that happen here with SpaceX and all. The Saturn V, literally the entire sky would turn uh, red and white like it was the, the noonday. 
and uh, it would light up the entire sky. And of course, I'm sure as a boy, it was even more uh, vivid in my imaginations than it actually was. But I, I can remember just the thunder and the sound uh, as, it, as it would make its way across the, the water and the idea that, you know, that it would go up and carry men uh, to, to the moon. I decided at that point that one day I would go to the moon. Little did I realize that just being in school and taking up space did not qualify you to be in space. But uh, it, it, was, it was so fascinating to me. And of course, I think because it was that I was an eyewitness. I didn't hear about it. I didn't read about it in a book. I think it's because we actually experienced it uh, firsthand. Uh, now people say, you know, if they make it affordable and you can actually go into space, would you? And I say, absolutely no. No, no, 10 times no. I have no interest at this point. I'm so excited. The next time I go into space will be the rapture. And I'm looking forward to that. But the fact that you could experience it, and this is what I love about being Pentecostal, is that you can experience God for yourself. We don't ask you to just believe what your grandmother taught or what your grandpa lived. We're not asking you to just you know, believe what we teach. We're not asking you to just, uh, you know, subscribe to the teachings of an ancient book. But we're saying you can know God for yourself. You can be a witness of the resurrection. Uh, in the late 1940s, a lady by the name of Brownie Wise first saw Tupperware. Tupperware at that time was a new... Um, polyethylene product for food storage. And it was being sold with very limited success at department stores. And Miss Wise was a successful branch manager for a well-known home party company. And, and with her zeal and her organization ability and her philosophy of sales, she convinced several other managers that Tupperware should be sold at home parties because users needed to experience Tupperware. And she said the only way that Tupperware is going to really sell and reach the level that it's capable of is for people to actually experience it by learning how to burp the airtight seal correctly. Do you remember Tupperware and how you had to burp it? Almost like a little baby, huh? You had to push down in the middle, and the air would go out, and then you sealed it. Well, she convinced uh, some area, ma area managers that this is the way to sell Tupperware, is in home parties where women can actually get their hands on it and see how it works and so forth. And so she switched over to selling Tupperware in home parties, and she recruited dealers and managers, and she started to thrive. She started to sell so much Tupperware at home parties that at one point, this lady alone was selling more Tupperware than all of the stores that Tupperware was in. She started a company that was called Tupperware Patio Parties. And she started selling so much that it caught the attention of the inventor of Tupperware, which was a man by the name of Earl Tupper. He named it after himself. He was a chemist. And he had created this, this lightweight, you know, non-breakable plastic container in 1946 and it caught his attention. He saw an opportunity to make home parties successful. And so he asked this lady, uh, Brownie Wise, to become the vice president of his company, which he readily accepted. And then Earl Tupper took Tupperware out of the hardware stores, out of the department stores, and he started to sell it exclusively through the home party plan, and the rest is history. We all had Tupperware in our cupboards. Well, the, the point is that it's much easier to sell something that you can experience. It's much easier to sell something that you can actually get your hands on, that you can believe in. When we look to the Word of God and we see that these disciples, these followers of Christ were so ardent, many of them even uh, went to their death for preaching and proclaiming the resurrected Christ. That was really the kiss of death, so to speak, for the disciples is when they preached about the resurrection. 
Uh, of course, during the ministry of Jesus, uh, the focus was on Jesus. But after he ascended, went into heaven, and the disciples began to preach, when they preached about the resurrection of Jesus, it was really what divided. Even uh, Paul, as he would begin to preach about the resurrection, there was a division that would take place because the Pharisees uh, believed in the resurrection of humanity, though they didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They did believe in the resurrection of humanity in spirit form, but the Sadducees didn't. And so you, you'll see sometimes where Paul was able to divide the crowd because he would start preaching the resurrection. But when the disciples preached the resurrection of Jesus, it was uh, something that totally enraged them. But they believed in it so much that many of them were martyred because of this. Uh, why was it that they were so adamant? Why was it that they were so convinced? It was because they had experienced it. They were eyewitnesses to it. The first group of people that I want to talk about tonight that were witnesses to the resurrection is the women, the women that came to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, of course, what an amazing story. Um, her story of where she came from and how uh, God delivered her and her love for the Lord is just, um, it's, an, it's an amazing story. In fact, if you've seen any of that Chosen series, it really starts out with the testimony of of Mary Magdalene, and it's, it's very vivid. But, I mean, Jesus Christ uh, totally transformed her life, and she never forgot it. And she was so uh, faithful, even after they had crucified him. And the disciples, of course, were having their issues with uh, what all had taken place and, and them going back out to the Sea of Galilee to fish and all of that. But the next day, Mary Magdalene carried some of the spices that were required for burial of course you understand in that day and have formaldehyde and the chemicals that we use today they they would literally wrap the body in these clothes and they would put spices in there to offset the, the smell of decaying flesh and all of that and and so that was part of their routine and their ritual and it was done by the loved ones it was done by the the family members and mary magdalene she she uh was excited i mean this is not something that people look forward to doing but Mary Magdalene was excited, and she waited for her friends, some other ladies that had promised they would go with her. And, and when they all arrived, she could hardly hold herself back. She was walking so fast that her friend Joanna tried to slow her down. Mary, what's your hurry? He's not going anywhere. I mean, why are we racing? But Mary, she couldn't, maybe she couldn't quite put her finger on it, but she was running. There was, a, there was an urgency that was in her heart. And as she got closer to the tomb, they were astonished to find that this large stone that had covered the opening and had been sealed by the Romans, it was uh, already uh, removed. And to her surprise, Jesus' body was missing. The, the group of women that were there, they just, they just stood there shocked. The tomb was empty. They had come. They had come to help prepare the body, to put the spices in and all. And then they remembered Jesus' words, the words that he would rise again. And as the, the ladies were there witnessing this resurrection, contemplating, rehearsing in their mind what Jesus had taught them, suddenly two men appear in shining, you know, white apparel. And then fear uh, gripped these ladies' hearts. They immediately dropped to their, their knees and their faces toward the ground. And the, the men, as we know, of course, were angels. Why? They said to Asked them this question, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Luke 24 records that. And so as the angels uh, spoke and the women were astonished, uh, there was, had to be a, a, a transformation in their own hearts and in their own spirits because now hope uh, begins to rise in their hearts and they uh, become excited now. And the possibility, they, they were afraid to even believe it, but now... There was visible evidence that indeed Jesus was not in the tomb and that he had risen. And so they were excited and they went to tell the disciples what they had seen and heard. And it's not clear why. I think I know why. But the disciples didn't believe the women at first. And the reason that I don't think they believed them at first is because they had not yet witnessed what these ladies had witnessed. There's something about the supernatural it's hard to believe until you can know it for yourself. 
until you can witness it for yourself. But Peter and John, of course, you know, they were curious and they bolted from the rest of the group and they ran to find everything was just as the women had reported. John, he, he stopped and sort of stooped down and peered inside, but Peter ran past him and just ran right into the tomb, as Peter was prone to do, uh, just get right in there and, and, you know, grab a hold of the garment and find out exactly what it is, put his, put his hands on it all. And so now they've experienced the resurrection. They are witnesses of this. And of course, they begin to believe and tell the others and, and things begin to uh, move from that point forward as other disciples came to to see and to witness this for themselves. One of the things that I believe is so important, and this is kind of what the transformation of these disciples were going through at this point, was that I think it's incumbent on all of us to remember his promises. Sometimes when we feel and we're in the presence of God on a routine basis, and we have message in tongues, we have promises from the word of God, and we have even things in our own spirit that God prompts us with, it's easy after a while to hear it over and over and to sort of take it for granted. No doubt the disciples had heard these promises over and over again. You know that he would never leave us nor forsake us, as Hebrews 13 says. And yet, in their humanity, you know, they trudged along, you know, groaning about, you know, how hard it is sometimes to just get through. And, and yet there were all of these promises that surrounded them. And I got to thinking that really is the same with us today. We can all focus on the cares of life, we can focus on the struggles of life, or we can get up every day and we can read the promises of God and we can begin to believe that the promises of God are sure and amen and they are a part of our everyday life. Jesus promised that he would rise on the third day and yet they had trouble believing that. But he also promised new life through the Holy Ghost, which we read about in John 14. He promised power through his name when they and us would receive the Holy Ghost. And as Christians, I believe a lot of times we live far below our privileges when we forget God's promises. We live below our privileges when we forget God's promises. But 1 Corinthians 1, uh, or 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and verse 20 says, the promises of God are sure. You can count on them. When Jesus prophesied that he would rise from the grave on the third day after his death, the disciples should have expected it to happen. But unfortunately, because of their lack of faith, they almost missed one of the most important parts of the plan of Christ. Jesus planned to be alive and working among us after he died and rose again. That was part of it. It was part of his earthly ministry. But they got so captivated with the immediate surroundings that they were in and the adversity from uh, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Roman government and all of that drama that they almost forgot the promises of God's word. And I get to thinking about here we are today in 2023, and yes, we stop at this time of the year to reflect and to think about the resurrection and the promises of God, but folks, we have this word at our disposal every day, every moment of every day. And if we're not careful, there's all this noise from social media and there's all this noise from the news and, and there's all this noise about his trunk getting arrested or not getting arrested. And I think to myself, there's so much noise out there. If we're not careful, we will lose sight of the promises of God's word. Jesus is coming again. Just as sure as he rose from the dead, Jesus is coming again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I think every day you ought to remind yourself of the promises of God's word and say, Lord, I don't want to take it for granted. I want to be aware of the promises of God's word. I want to wake up every day and say, could this be the day that Jesus comes back? Oh, hallelujah. The fact that Jesus is alive is central. It is crucial to God's plan of salvation. Everything that we believe, everything that we teach, that we preach, is based on us being eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Now let's go into this a little bit deeper because I believe it's important for us to understand that it's very possible to be very close to something that's very unique and for us to miss it. 
Let me ask you this question. And you don't have to stand and testify and give an answer. It's just a rhetorical question. But you can just ask it to yourself. Have you ever been around a celebrity and didn't realize it? Somebody famous maybe that you were around. I, I, I thought about uh, my own response to that uh, question. I thought about when I was a boy and I used to um, like to go down to Dodger Town in Vero Beach and to watch the spring training uh, games with my grandfather. I told you that my grandfather loved baseball. And so in, in the spring, we would always try to go to the spring training baseball games. Of course, it was much smaller back then than it is now where, you know, people come down from up north and spend, you know, the whole month of March down here going and watching their favorite team. Back then, it was just kind of locals. There'd be maybe, you know, 2,500 people. People just sit on the hill down there in Vero Beach. And uh, I remember going down and, and watching the Dodgers play, and I, I, I became such a fixture down there. In fact, my father was trying to motivate me to uh, get good grades in school. My sister was always a straight-A student. Little David was a different story. They were trying to just keep me in school. And um, so my parents, always being very positive people, very goal-oriented people, um, they were trying to motivate me. My father said, son, uh, you like going to Dodger Town? Yes. For every A you get in school, you'll be able to have a day off of school to go watch the Dodgers. I would make so many A's. I would accumulate them all year long. I remember one time they were uh, trying to motivate me for getting straight A's so that I would realize that I could do it if I really worked at it. And um, so they said, I remember I wanted a swimming pool, and they said, we're going to get a swimming pool if you'll make straight A's. And so my sister was, was tutoring me. The whole family was working. My mother was helping. I mean, because ever, everybody in the family wanted the swimming pool. But it was all dependent on David getting straight A's. And uh, so I was like, oh, this is going to require me reading and studying. And, uh, you know, so I was working at it, and we finally did complete that six weeks, and, and I got straight A's. And So my dad got one of those uh, pools that it was an above-ground pool. We stretched it out in the backyard, but the deep end, you would dig a hole, and part of the vinyl would go down. Does anybody remember those pools? Yeah. It wasn't the best kind, but it was, you know, sort of an in-between above-ground pool and in-the-ground pool. And um, now the Jenkins, they had an in-ground pool, but we were not rich like them. We didn't have, we just wanted something that we could, you know, splash around in. And uh, I remember I was so excited. And my dad and I got in the backyard over there on Reed Avenue. We laid out, we got this big vinyl pool, we laid it out. We tried to figure out where we were going to put it and how we were going to work it around the fruit trees and all of that. And when it was all said and done, uh, my dad said, what about... If we don't do a swimming pool and we just buy you a drum set. And I said, that works for me. So we rolled it all back up. And before we could get the vote from the girls in the family, we decided on a drum set. And we rolled it all back up, put it in the box, and took it back to the store. And my mom and sister said, where's the swimming pool? And dad said, instead of the pool, we're getting David a drum set. Oh, my goodness, the family was not in favor of this. Much to the chagrin of my family and our church, little David got a drum set. But uh, we, we, we had these A's that we accumulated to go to Dodgertown. So I just started hanging out down there. and I didn't even realize who these people were. I was just a kid, and I was driving the golf cart for Steve Garvey and and they played golf down there most of the time. They just would play a game like when they had to. They were basically on vacation down there. I mean, they would stretch a little bit, you know, baseball players. They were all prima donnas. And they were all just kind of bouncing around down there, getting stretching out for the new season coming up. And I would play catch with Bob Welch. I mean, he was a pitcher that was just coming up. Ron Say, I, we called him the penguin because he ran kind of funny. And I would eat in the mess hall with them all and, and uh, people would be like, do you know who these people are? And I'm like, they're just baseball players. But because I was around them so much, they even made me the bat boy. And I remember I had so many autographs. I had autographs of this and that and Johnny Bench and Reggie Jackson and these other teams that would come. And I had all these autographs. I would have had, if I would have kept all of the autographs that I had, 
jerseys and bats and gloves. I'm telling you right now, I could have sold it for a fortune. But I didn't really realize the value of it because I was just, I was there with them all. I mean, I enjoyed it. I knew they were major league baseball players, but I had no idea, you know, a signed bat would one day be, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. I didn't know that. I just thought, well, this is an old bat. They're getting rid of it. And a signature, I mean, anybody can sign their name. So who, who cares, you know? I, I kept all this memorabilia. But then when I was a senior in high school, I tutored uh, 12 kids that were gifted at Creel Elementary, six girls and six boys. They were amazing kids. And I, I learned that I could motivate, of course, you know, here we now I've learned it from my parents. I could motivate these boys by giving uh, all of this different, you know, every time they would get an A or they would ace an exam, I would give them, you know, one of these signed pictures or this or that and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, there's no telling how much, how much money I gave away that senior year in high school. I literally gave away all that stuff. I have none of it left. In fact, I told the story uh, recently to my sons, and they were like, what? You gave it to a bunch of fifth graders at Creole Elementary? What were you thinking? I said, I don't know. I, was, I, I, just, I, I knew it was a value, but I didn't think it was that much value. And I got to thinking about how that can be possible for you and I if we're around this all the time. It's easy to take it for granted that we get to sit in heavenly places, that we are rubbing shoulders with angelic beings, that we can, I mean, you think about the presence of God, even right here at East Wind that we've experienced in the last few weeks. I mean, I, people, uh, people that have never had a chance to experience this, I mean, they, they would camp out to be able to have, but we come and we, and I, we're good people, we, we, we love God and we, we understand the value, but do we really understand the value that we are able to sit in heavenly places and what God gives us is of such value. It's very possible that we can be around it so much and witness it that it doesn't have the significance that it should have. But oh, my friend, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, when you and I think about the great experience that we have, what we witness on a regular basis. Now, the Bible talked about how he was going to give the Holy Ghost because he was going to give them power to witness, but it's also a witness to the power of God. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, you are a witness to the power of God. You are a witness to the resurrecting power of God. An example in the Word of God, and this is the second group I want to talk about um, tonight that witnessed the resurrection was these two men from Emmaus. They were walking along. Uh, Cleopas and his friend, they were walking from, from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they were, they were deeply engaged in conversation about Jesus. And then out of nowhere, a stranger, you know, just walking along the road, just sort of joined them. And um, we know it was Jesus now, but they didn't know. And the Bible says that they saw him, but they didn't recognize him as Jesus. That's what Luke 24 says. And when Jesus asked why they were so downcast, they were astonished that someone in the vicinity had not heard about Jesus and his crucifixion. That's, they were followers of Christ. They were downcast because he had been crucified. And finally, Jesus responded to their doubt-filled discussion. He explained that all that had happened was documented in the ancient you know, writings, uh, the inspired writings, which we would know of today, would be the prophecies of the Old Testament. He expounded on the prophet's words, but the two disciples still, they did not recognize him. He went with them to eat in the village, and as he broke bread, their eyes were opened. And what a surprise to realize that this was the resurrected Jesus. The Jesus that they had been so discouraged about. Uh, within seconds of them realizing this is Jesus, he vanished. But when they realized that Jesus had been with them, they left to tell the disciples about the resurrection. What a beautiful moment when Cleophas and his companion realized that they had been talking with the resurrected Christ. Have you ever had that moment in your life where you think, you know what? This was a God moment. Something happens and you thought it was just a coincidence and you were going through your everyday routine and all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, what I just experienced was the intervention of the Almighty God. What a powerful moment when you recognize I wasn't just going through the motions uh, God stepped in right there and helped me with something that may have been a minor issue, but because you know God did it, hallelujah, it makes you love him all the more. 
Hallelujah. What a great God we serve. Knowing the validity of truth inspires us to want to share it more readily with others. According to Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, the time span between Jesus' resurrection, the ascension, was 40 days. During this time, numerous passages of Scripture testify that Jesus appeared to many people, eating them and walking and talking with them. People had multiple opportunities over those 40 days to discover that Jesus rose from the dead and was alive again. I believe it is important for us today, even as we contemplate this weekend, the resurrection of Christ. And of course, you're you know, going to be celebrating. We're going to be with families. We're going to be eating. We're going to be enjoying the presence of God. But we must not allow disappointment to blind us from recognizing that Jesus is with us. I say we must not allow disappointment to blind us from recognizing that Jesus is with us. We know that life is full of trouble. We know there's challenges. But you know what, folks? We've got to always step back from it and realize we're not walking this journey by ourselves. That's why you got to lift up your head. You don't want to live your life with your head down. You won't see who's standing right next to you. Jesus is with you. Jesus is near us. He's not far off on a journey. He's not out of reach or out of touch. He's as close as the very mention of his name. Hallelujah. And you know what? If we're not careful, we can get disappointed about life. Uh, it would be easy to allow disappointment and dismay to become our focus uh, when we're going through difficulties. Uh, but as we see in this passage uh, and as we see throughout life, uh, when the followers of Christ uh, only focused on the crucifixion, uh, they could have easily missed uh, the resurrection. Uh, and if we're not careful, we'll focus on the trials and the troubles uh, and the sickness and the cares uh, and the disappointments. But oh, my friend, uh, we've got to be resurrection minded did. We got to look on the supernatural and remember that God, hallelujah, is going to have the final say in all matters. Even when there's been an injustice, even when somebody that's been hurt, that was an innocent party. Oh, my friend, God's going to have the final say in all matters. Oh, hallelujah. Harsh trials can sometimes crush your faith and cause you want to be discouraged. We've got to look beyond present circumstances and hold on to the promises that Jesus is right here with us. That really has to happen every time we have to say goodbye to a loved one. Every time we have to say goodbye to someone prematurely. Every time we have to say goodbye to someone who goes on and they go to be with the Lord ahead of their time. And all of us, as witnesses of it, we have to think about their life. We rejoice with their memories. But there is those bittersweet moments when you say, I'm going to miss them. But I love the way we do it here at Eastwind. We have home-going services. Yes, we're going to miss them being here next to us. But you know what? We celebrate because we choose to look up and focus on the resurrection rather than the crucifixion. We choose to lift up our heads and say, but God, hallelujah, is a God that's got everything in his hand. He's going to have the final say. He's the God of all eternity. So instead of being sad, we lift up our heads. Uh, we choose hope rather than hurt. Hallelujah. Oh, my friend, what a great God we have. I say to you today that we are eyewitnesses of the resurrection. We are eyewitnesses of the, of the resurrection of Jesus. And you say, how can that be? Let me explain it to you in the few moments I have. Finally, the third category are the disciples that witnessed the resurrection. Jesus appeared and told them, tell others about the resurrection. As the two men walked to Emmaus, they ate with the disciples. Jesus appeared in their presence. He spoke to them saying, peace be unto you. But still, when he appeared, they thought he was a ghost, and they were terrified. And he assured them that he was not a ghost, that he had flesh and bones. He allowed them to see his hands and his feet. Of course, you know, uh, Thomas, to put his hand in his side. They were still having trouble realizing the, the impact of that signal moment. But Jesus asked for something to eat. 
And as he ate with them and expounded on the scriptures, what a revelation it was to hear Jesus teaching once again. And Jesus used that moment to confirm who he was and that his work would continue. These disciples would carry on his mission after he ascended. He was indeed the Messiah, but not in the way that they originally thought. Jesus' kingdom was going to be heavenly, not earthly. Jesus spent time teaching his followers and reminding them that the promise of the Father would live on. When we read in Luke 24, 47 through 49, Jesus commissioned his disciples to preach repentance and the remission of sins in his name. And as Christ's eyewitnesses, they would bear the responsibility of sharing the good news. Jesus instructed them to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father endued them with power from on high. And then there was the prophecy of the promise of the Holy Ghost, which came to them while they waited in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, as we read about in Acts chapter 2. Why is that important? Because we must believe in the reality of the resurrection. As 21st century believers, we are generations removed from the people who witnessed the resurrection of Christ in real time. However, as we read, as we hear eyewitnesses of the resurrection because of the Holy Ghost, because we feel and know that God lives in our hearts, we experience the reality of the resurrection. Every time somebody lifts their hands and begins to call upon the name of Jesus, begin to exalt the name of Jesus, and the Lord fills them with the gift of the Holy Ghost. One more time, there is another eyewitness uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, they are eyewitnesses. You are eyewitnesses. I am an eyewitness that he lived and died and rose again on the third day. The disciples fulfilled Jesus' commandment on the day of Pentecost. They instructed those who gathered around there and experienced this, they said, you know what? You've got to repent. That's the death. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the burial. And you've got to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the resurrection. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off, even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. When we talk about the ladies that experienced it and witnessed the resurrection, we talk about the two men on the road to Emmaus that witnessed and experienced the resurrection. Then we talk about the disciples that witnessed and experienced the resurrection. Even Peter, there was a bridge that took place between those disciples and you and I here today. And that bridge was the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They had eyewitnesses. of They, they knew, they said they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That was part of it. But there was a responsibility that went with being an eyewitness of the resurrection. And that was that they were to preach the gospel. Why? Because the gospel would cause the resurrection to extend far beyond just those that had that personal experience uh, in Jerusalem. The gospel would make the resurrection uh, be propagated out for years and for ages and for centuries to come. And that's why he said, this promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call, so that the witness of the resurrection is all around us today. Jesus was the most obvious witness of the resurrection to his followers, and they may have questioned what they saw, but they could not deny that he talked to them, that he ate with them, and that he allowed them to see and to feel his hands and his feet. Just as Jesus took the time to walk among humanity for 40 days before returning to glory, we, you and I, can witness the resurrection of Christ all around us today. You say, Pastor, how do we witness the resurrection? We witness the resurrection by experiencing the gospel. Believing is the first part of that journey. You can't even start this journey unless you believe. But our faith calls us to act upon our belief. And when we believe that Jesus did live and died and rose again, we agree that he did what he promised to do. And although that was nearly 2,000 years ago, we can witness the resurrection by experiencing all that God has for us and God's plans for us. He's going to resurrect us one day from death when the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we 
we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Every time he forgives us of our sins, uh, every time somebody goes down in the water in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, every time somebody is healed by his stripes, we are healed. We are reminded once again that Jesus is alive and well. Hallelujah. And the gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is an illustration of our salvation. Romans 6, 4 said, We're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, here's the comparison, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. That that resurrection, it's not just confined to Jesus and word. We are transported into the fact that you and I become eyewitnesses. Secondly, we identify with Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. We know that death is dying out to sin. We die out to sin through repentance. But repentance calls for us to turn from all those things that separate us from Christ. And when we repent, we ask God to forgive us of our sins. Why? So that we can walk closely with him just like those men did on the road to Emmaus. He'll walk with you. That's why when you repent of your sin, you turn and you walk the other direction, Jesus can walk with you. Hallelujah. Because you said, I want to serve the Lord. He, he gives us that identity through baptism. We're buried in the baptism in Jesus' name. And then once we go down in that watery grave in baptism, we come up out of the water, a new creature in Christ Jesus. We identify with his death so that we can identify with his resurrection. And so we experience, we are witnesses of the power of his resurrection through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. This is why Peter spoke of the resurrection when he preached on the day of Pentecost only a few days after Christ had ascended and gone into heaven. Jesus' words were still fresh in his mind when he stood up and he declared to those people that gathered that were hungry for the promise of the Father. He said, you got to repent. you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. But you're going to experience the resurrection through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And ladies and gentlemen, these men, they gave their life for it. They were convinced of it. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. Hallelujah. They say, how could these men give their life for a Christ that had been crucified and was no longer there? You know why? Because they were witnesses of the resurrection. And my friend, you've got to be a witness of the resurrection. You've got to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's why we don't believe the infilling of the Holy Ghost is optional. It is a requirement. Hallelujah. You've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not some bonus round for good behavior. It's a part of who we are. It's the resurrection of Christ in us. It's crucial that we experience the full process of the resurrection and that we share our experience with those who have not heard. I think some, so many times we experience the revelation of the resurrection, and then they would go and share it. The ladies went and shared it with the disciples. The men in Emmaus went and shared it with the disciples. The disciples shared it through the preaching on the day of Pentecost. It's meant to be shared. What you've experienced is not just for you. It's to be shared with others. And as you continue to share it with others, it flows through you. That's the full process of the resurrection. We share the experience with those who have not heard, to those that have not had that hands-on experience. They have not yet been eyewitnesses of the glory of God. We share it with them. And then they identify with Christ through the death, burial, and the resurrection. Jesus told those who witnessed his resurrection, he told them to preach about it, proclaim this glorious experience to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so today we can mirror that mission by preaching salvation through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It is still applicable today, just as it was when Peter preached in Jerusalem. It is critical to Christ's mission that we follow his blueprint for salvation. So if we have experienced the saving power of Jesus, we can share it with others. We don't have to be theologians. We don't have to be scholars. You don't have to be a Bible school graduate. You just share your testimony with others. Jesus loves you. You got to repent of your sins. You got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. As Brother Gleason was preaching Sunday morning, you got to be, 
You've got to be those epistles that are read by all men. You've got to be that conduit that people can find. You're the ones that pre you're the ones that take it to the highways and the byways. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're giving people an opportunity to be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. You're saying, hey, Easter's got to be more than bunny rabbits and Easter egg hunts. You've got to experience the power of the resurrection. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. Oh, I get excited just talking about it. Jesus is wanting to do that. This is what God is wanting to do in Palm Bay and Melbourne. This is what he's wanting to do in Florida. This is what he's wanting to do all around the world. He's wanting people to know him through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Would you stand to your feet? What a great God we serve. Oh, hallelujah. Proclaim it, proclaim it. Tell everybody you know. We have witnessed firsthand what the gospel can do for us. But it's not just for us. It's for everybody. I'll never forget seeing an interview. Some of you may remember the old days when Larry King was interviewing people on the radio. And uh, I remember he would be on late at night. This before he even had a television program on CNN. He used to have a radio program. He started, I guess, came to fame when he was down in Miami. But uh, he, was, he was great at interviewing people. He'd interview authors about their books and whatnot. And I remember him interviewing a man by the name of Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson was a man who had been a cabinet member of the Nixon administration, had been involved in all the, the Watergate uh, crisis and, and all of that that went on with uh, that Watergate scandal. And I think he even served time in prison um, after the uh, Nixon administration was over. And um, he ended up uh, converting Christianity and starting a prison ministry that was, Brother Blackman, very profound. I mean, you know uh, it still carries on today. That I can't think of the title of the ministry, but it reached hundreds of thousands of prisoners. And, um, and Larry King was interviewing Chuck Colson. He'd written a book about it, and he was interviewing him about Christianity. Larry King, of course, was Jewish, and he was, he was curious about Chuck Colson's conversion to Christianity. And he, I remember Larry King asking him this. He said, how do you know for sure that Jesus rose from the dead? And I remember Chuck Colson saying, you know, when I was a part of the Nixon administration, and everything started to go south, and we realized the president was either going to have to be impeached or was going to resign, and the ship was going down. He said, I saw those men jumping off that ship like rats fleeing a sinking ship. Everybody was every man for himself. And he said, everybody realized that they had to paddle their own canoe, so to speak. He said, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, these disciples would not have given their life. Every one of them gave their life and were martyred. And if this was just a made-up story, Mr. King, they would not have given their life for a fable or a, some sort of a legend of a made-up story. They gave their life because they were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And I'll never forget Larry King saying, well, I can't argue with that. I can't argue with that. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you here tonight can testify, oh, Jesus has been there for you? You know he was there, hallelujah, when you didn't have anybody else to turn to. Jesus Christ was there. You felt his presence come into the room. You felt him wrap his arm of love around you. You know that Jesus is real. I believe even our children, maybe some of your children are not serving God, but they were raised in the Sunday school. Maybe they were raised in this church. And you know what? They know that Jesus is real. Hallelujah. And when push comes to shove, there is nothing like the plan of salvation. There's nothing like the love of Jesus Christ that draws us back into his presence. Oh, why don't we lift up our hands right now? Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You have made us eyewitnesses of your resurrection power through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. What a great God you are, Lord. You have given us undeniable proof. You have given us evidence of your spirit. Hallelujah. When you fill us with your spirit, you give us evidence. It's not something you just ask us to believe. But, oh, God, you give us proof. You give us evidence. Over and over, you prove yourself to your people. Thank you, Lord.